It's a real privilege and pleasure to be here with you today. And I can't think of a, a nicer venue to have a presentation. I mean, this place is great. Um, before I get started, I just want to say thank you to Steve and to Gray for inviting me and uh, allowing me to share my story with each and every one of you. Now, I just ask for 22 minutes of your time and attention to discuss a very important issue facing modern America. And that issue is lack of integrity. Lack of integrity. What is integrity? Integrity can best be defined as incorruptibility. But it seems like integrity these days is the exception rather than the rule. Why is that? Why is integrity so hard to come by? Everyone in this room, everyone in our city, everyone in our country has had their integrity tested at one point or another. Whether it's cheating on your taxes, cheating on your spouse, turning a blind eye to wrongdoing, or maybe just cutting corners at your job, no one is immune from the temptation of acting corrupt. And we see corruption all around us in the 24-hour news cycles reporting on insider trading on Wall Street, government embezzlement, doping in sports, political bribery, corporate fraud, and the hot-button issue of the day, police corruption. I experienced police corruption as a rookie New Jersey State Trooper. But before I get into that, let me take you back to the State Police Academy for a moment, where as a recruit, myself and my classmates were taught criminal law, traffic enforcement, firearms training, self-defense training, police ethics, among other topics. But the police ethics training really resonated with me. It just made a lot of sense. We were taught over and over and over again about the importance, it's imperative, to do what's right when no one is watching and not to let a 15-minute car stop ruin a 25-year career. But I qu came to find out very quickly that training in the State Police Academy was vastly different than training on the street. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you know a police officer? Okay, the, the vast majority. What department do they work for? Wow, okay, so Miami. Well, I think we would all agree that blue lives matter. I also think that those that we know, when he or she graduates from a police academy, they're assigned a training officer. And that training officer acts as a mentor to the rookie. That relationship is very formative. The rookie learns how to write a traffic ticket how to investigate crime, how to make an arrest. That relationship builds a foundation for the rest of their career. Unfortunately for me, my training officer must have either missed the police ethics training or chose to disregard it. Because with 11 days on the job, 11 days, I witnessed my training officer unlawfully arrest a 22-year-old woman for drunk driving. The problem with the arrest was she wasn't behind the wheel. In fact, she was in the back seat. Things went from bad to worse when I found myself writing a false report 
a false story dictated to me by my training officer with my name on it. So why would he act corrupt? Why would he do such a thing? What's his motivation? I'd like for you to take a, a look at the video clip of the actual car stop. Now while you're watching the video, listen to the dialogue, but also ask yourself, how would I handle this situation? Roll it. Why don't you uh, turn around and put your hands behind your back for me? You're going to be under arrest for DWI. Oh, relax. Turn around, put your hands behind your back. Turn around, put your hands behind your back. This guy was driving, apparently, with a license plate. Yeah, but she got in the car. So, just check under the seat, make sure you don't see anything. And, uh, the keys. I wonder who has the keys. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. check underneath the seat. Check it. Uh, Eric, can you go and talk to that? Who's is your purse? Who's is yours? Who's mine? Is that? It's sure. Yours? Okay, here, hold it. Um, who's driving the car? They ran. The guy ran? Yeah, they told ran, and I got scared. She got in the front. She got in the front. They took off. Two guys. Yeah, yeah. You know who they are? No, it's fine. Okay, so there I was. 11 days on the job, I'm watching my training officer unlawfully arrest someone that should not have been arrested. I was in the middle of the most difficult test of integrity of my life. My dream job slowly started becoming my worst nightmare. I remember asking myself, why is this happening? I didn't sign up for this. They didn't teach me this scenario at the State Police Academy. But what I did realize is that my training officer was a cowboy, not a cop. But I mustered up enough gumption to confront him. I said, sir, with all due respect, what you did was wrong. He looked at me like I just slapped him across the face and asked me to repeat myself. So I said, sir, what you did was wrong. We didn't have probable cause to arrest the 22-year-old. Therefore, I will not testify in court in support of the arrest. His face turned beet red. And he looked at me and said, who do you think you are, Hobson? you better keep your mouth shut. Besides, what do you even know about probable cause? You're just a rookie. Keep your mouth shut. Well, as you can imagine, our relationship took an abrupt turn for the worse. But when I found myself in court, reference to that DUI arrest, I was alongside my training officer. And we were in a judge's chambers in a municipal court. The prosecutor came in. The prosecutor looked at us after viewing the video in length that you just saw and said, hey, troopers, I, I just saw the video of the car stop. Are you sure the woman was driving the car that night? Without hesitation, I step in front of my training officer. And I said, uh, sir, she was not driving the car. It was a bad arrest. With that, the prosecutor dropped the DUI charge and traffic tickets. Leaving court that day, I felt a sense of relief for 
just speaking out against some wrongdoing. I felt good for helping somebody. But word traveled very quickly throughout the state police that I was a whistleblower and I was not to be trusted. I quickly became the round peg in the square hole. From that point on, I was relentlessly harassed and bullied. The ramifications, I was physically assaulted on a regular basis by a veteran trooper who would drive his elbow into my chest every opportunity he had. My car was vandalized. I would leave work, go to my car, there would be chewing tobacco spit coating the driver's side door and cartoons glued to my windshield. I was ostracized. Hate notes were left on my locker advising me to lose the chip on my shoulder or someone's going to take care of it for me. This happened for months. It got so bad for so long that I considered handing in my gun and badge and resigning from the force. But I came to find out that the guys that were harassing me called themselves the Lords of Discipline, the LOD. And I was the first trooper to be victimized by the group. As a matter of fact, they've been around for decades harassing fellow troopers. In fact, they wore t-shirts inscribed Lords of Discipline underneath their police uniforms. They placed watermelons in the lockers of black troopers. They drove nails into the car tires of women who didn't fit the state police mold. They poured salt and left hate notes for tro rookie troopers like myself who didn't toe the line. I realized I couldn't quit now. I realized I had to take on the LOD. So with that, I took tan tangible evidence and a written chronology of events that occurred to the State Police Internal Affairs Unit. I was interviewed for hours, but I blew the whistle on the LOD. Two weeks after blowing the whistle on the group, another trooper who was being bullied by the LOD shot and killed himself outside of a local church. Now let me tell you about that trooper. His name was John Oliva. John was a standout high school football player, decorated Marine, black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And in 1998, John graduated number one out of 150 recruits. John graduated number one in his state police class. He was squared away. But as a rookie, John's training officer was teaching him how to racially profile, pulling over motorists based on their race. John refused, and his refusal was an invitation for the Lords of Discipline to harass him. So bad that he took a 40 caliber Glock, pointed it to his heart, and shot and killed himself. In light of John's suicide and my fresh allegations into the Lords of Discipline, the New Jersey State Police began the largest internal investigation in history. And I was the centerpiece to that investigation. I was interviewed over and over and over again by State Police Internal Affairs and New Jersey's Attorney General's Office. At that point in my life, things turned upside down for me. After being interviewed by the Attorney General, General's office, a Deputy Attorney General asked me to be a star witness in a general court-martial against troopers affiliated with the Lords of Discipline. So I did. I testified against the Lieutenant Sergeant Veteran Trooper all of which pled or were found guilty and suspended. 
when I wasn't working, I constantly looked over my shoulder. I watched as state police cars pulled to the front of my home in the middle of the night, shine spotlights into my bedroom. Minutes later, my phone would ring by an unknown caller. I pick up the phone, there would just be heavy breathing on the other end, trying to intimidate me. Fellow troopers were caught running my license plate, ac accessing my personal information, and I knew it wasn't to send me flowers. Fear, paranoia, and depression set in. The thick skin that I once had wore off. So I sought counseling for depression. I swallowed a cocktail of antidepressant medication and I chased it with alcohol. The friends and family that I had relied on to that point in my life slowly started to peel away. The relationship I had with my own father ceased as I lost his support. Those were the darkest days of my life. So with my back against the wall, I filed a federal lawsuit against the New Jersey State Police and Lords of Discipline in an attempt to hold them accountable for what they did to me as well as the trooper who committed suicide. I thought it was imperative for the public to know that some police officers act like unruly frat boys. It was a five-year legal battle, five years of battling in and out of court against the state police. But in the end, seven troopers were found guilty for harassing colleagues, and the state settled my case. But to this very day, the state denies the existence of the Lords of Discipline. One pearl of wisdom that I learned in this experience is the power of prayer. Prayer instilled a sense of hope. It gave me a light at the end of a very dark tunnel. It was the only way, the only way, I was able to forge ahead. I leaned on the relationship with my Heavenly Father. Someone once said that a clean conscience makes a soft pillow, and I believe that's true. When I saw corruption, I put my career and my life on the line to unearth wrongdoing. And today, I can look at myself in the mirror knowing I didn't compromise myself. As a result, in 2012, I authored a book, Breaking the Blue Wall, One Man's War Against Police Corruption. I suppose the book was prophetic in a sense, considering today's unrest between law enforcement and urban communities across America. But by no means did I set out to be an author. The book was really an eight-year cathartic healing process for me. I wrote down my thoughts as passages, those passages became pages, and those pages became an award-winning book, which is available for you today. <laughs> I leave you with this. America has become a nation where the ends justify the means. Success these days is indicative of how many zeros we have in our bank accounts. Here's a news flash. You can't take it with you. You cannot take it with you. In the end, your character is more valuable than your assets. Your word is worth more than your wealth. When we die, we're remembered, fondly or not, by the relationships that we've formed and by the respect bestowed upon us by others. That's our legacy. So the next time you find yourself in the middle of a test of integrity, don't be corrupted. 
Next time you see wrongdoing, don't sit on your hands and talk underneath your breath. Speak up. If you see corruption, don't turn a blind eye because if you don't come forward, no one else will. That's what America is waiting for. America is waiting for someone like you and someone like me to stand up and act with integrity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.